Good evening. We are glad that you're here and uh, glad that you were able to take this opportunity to be with us tonight. If you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad that you're here. We ask that you fill out one of those cards that's in front of you and just leave it on the pew beside you or pass it to the end. As far as announcements we have, uh, Mickey and Trish Mathis are very proud because Brant and Jamie, you know, you say Brant and Jamie had a baby. I guess Jamie had the baby. Brant was there cheering on. But Hayden Lindsay Mathis, she was born Monday, 6 pounds, 13 ounces, 18 and a half inches long. As far as folks who are on our sick list, uh, Nell Schroeder is leaving Thursday. She's going to Florida, see her kids. Uh, we need to remember her in prayer. Leonard Zostel is having some health issues. We're going to pray for him. Flo Jones going to Louisville for some pre-surgical testing. Bob Hines got excellent news on his test, and he thanks everybody for their calls and for their prayers. Shella May is now home. We have a thank you card from her, and it's on the board out back. And Betty Stevenson, we need to remember her. She's been having some health problems as well. As far as upcoming stuff, uh, Keith Travis's history committee that's going to meet tonight in the library following services. Um, the people in that group are Keith, Janine, Sharon Tucker, Diane Temple, Jerry Sells, Don Walker, and Corey Westerfield. It's going to be a deacon's meeting next Sunday at 5 o'clock. Uh, also this Sunday night, we're going to be having our monthly singing and cookout. Everybody remember to bring sides, desserts, and drinks. It's going to be a finance committee meeting. That's the 25th. And also the blood drive is coming up on the 27th. As far as um, our speaker tonight, it's going to be Mike Rogers. He has been preaching in Covington, Tennessee for the last 13 years. Uh, we went to school together, Mike and I did. He earned his uh, master's in New Testament at Freed Hardeman. He's been married to Bonita, Bonita for 37 years, and he's got two boys who are preachers, Mitch, which is here. Uh, he's almost done with the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies, and also Justin, who will be our speaker next week. He teaches at Freed Hardeman. And in his biography, he said, most importantly, he has got two grandkids. So that's what he's most proud of. We're glad you're here glad to have the opportunity to uh, have you lead us in our thoughts. We're going to have our opening prayer, and then we'll have some singing. Let's pray. Our most holy Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you blessed us with to be a part of. We thank you, Lord, for a special place on earth that you blessed us to live we thank you for your strong presence that is around us. May we add to that each and every one, each day. Father, we thank you so much for our elders at this church family, how they lead us by example, the tremendous time and sacrifice that they put forth each day, and how they pray for each and every member of this congregation each and every day. Continue to bless them with wisdom, with endurance, and bless their families as they serve alongside them. Father, we thank you so much for Mark and the great things that you've brought towards us since he's been here, how we've grown. We thank you how he preaches your word so wonderfully each and every time he's up here. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. May we bring glory and honor to you in all that we do through this worship and all that we do and say each and every day. We ask your blessing on our guest speaker tonight. Thank you for him and his devotion to preaching your word and for the fruit that has, has come from his life as his sons also were following in his footsteps. May we do the same, Lord, with our families, teaching them the word so that this earth will be a better place for next generations. Forgive us for our sins. We pray Continue blessings on those who are sick and who are mentioned, that you'll be with them and bring healing and comfort to them and their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing and be happy. We'll sing all three verses. <clears throat>
Walking Alone to D. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Our song before the lesson, this evening will be number 979, number 979, I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. We'll sing all three verses. If it's convenient for you, please stand as we sing. <clears throat>
do not know me. I am Florence Robertson's second born. And I appreciate very, very much the invitation to be with you tonight. I encourage you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We're talking about this um, text that is normally called the parable of the prodigal son. It's my favorite text in all of the Bible. When I began to, to think about this several years ago, there, I've developed lessons on rebellion from the, the boy that rebelled against his daddy and left home, went out into a world of sin. I've preached lessons on the far country and the way people live when they leave the Lord. I've preached lessons on the hog pen, the lowest of the low. You can't get any lower. I've preached lessons on repentance when the boy came home. I've preached lessons on the daddy's forgiveness, forgiveness, the way the daddy responded to the boy's homecoming. I've preached lessons on the hidden selfishness from the older brother. And maybe other lessons in there as well. But a few weeks ago, my youngest son preached a sermon entitled The Homecoming Party. And I never really thought about this lesson from this parable as a homecoming in the party, in the celebration. And so tonight, I'm going to use at least one of his three points. And I'll tell you what his three main points were. Number one, why did the father celebrate? Number two, when did the father celebrate? And number three, how did the father celebrate? I don't know how far into this we'll get, but we're going to talk about why the father celebrated. Let's remind ourselves of this parable as we begin reading with verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living, that is, living without moral restraints. And when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And the father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, 
These many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, you have, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The question, I think, that we need to answer as we begin is what is the difference in a congratulations and a celebration? Have you ever thought about that? The difference, because when one responds to the invitation, they, they come down the aisle, whether it is the, whether they've been wallowing in the hog pen of sin and have come back, or whether they're responding to be buried with Christ in baptism, to have their sins washed away. It really matters not. We, they respond and we embrace them and we pat them on the back and we congratulate them. And that's about it, isn't it? At least that's about the way it has traditionally gone. I wonder if you can, unless you're in the office, unless you're, you're logging this information, I wonder if you can tell me how many people have been restored or have been baptized in this congregation this year. I wonder, you see, a celebration is more than just a congratulations. When a baby is born, like the family just had the baby, normally we celebrate, don't we? Normally we have a shower and we flood that family with gifts appropriate for a baby. I mean, at Covington, when a baby is born, the youth group does a diaper shower, and they have three tons of diapers that last about three weeks. And then the church gives them a shower, and they get these cute little outfits and bibs and pacifiers and bottles and all kinds of things appropriate for a baby. What do we do when a child is born into Christ? What do we do when one who has been wallowing in the hog pen of sin comes home? We congratulate well enough, but do we really celebrate? And so when you look at this parable and what, what Mitch in his lesson, what he started me to really think about is why did the father celebrate? Why did he celebrate? He saw the son coming from a, from a distance. He saw him coming. And the Bible says that he had compassion for him. He had compassion. The word compassion is translated from a word that sometimes is the heart, it is the seat of emotion, not the blood pump, but the seat of emotion. It is that idea of, of extreme sympathy and pity. When the daddy looked out and he saw this son, I want you to picture this boy. Draw a picture in your mind of this boy as he comes, coming down the road He's already made up his mind. He's got a rehearsed speech in his mind what he's going to do. He's going to say to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a hired servant. The daddy has compassion. Picture the boy coming. The boy has wasted everything that he got from his daddy. His entire inheritance is gone. All he has is the, the clothes on his back. 
and those are tattered and torn and caked with mud from the hog pen. And he comes down the road and daddy ran and embraced him and kissed him. Doesn't matter about the mud caked clothes. It doesn't matter about the stench of the hogs. All that matters is the compassion that he feels for that boy. The sympathy. I want you to understand something. When the boy said, I'm not worthy to be called your son, the, the daddy knew that there was more to what the boy wanted to say than what he said. He knew there was more to it than that. And so he interrupted the son. I, I read this, and I, I don't know why some translator hadn't put an ellipsis in here. Because he interrupts the son. And he said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Do you, do you realize the significance of the best robe? In Zechariah, Zechariah chapter number, uh, in Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 4, listen to what Zechariah says. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestures. You see what the father was doing when he said, You bring, bring the best robe and put it on him. He was saying, You are forgiven, my son. You are forgiven. I'm not accepting you back as a servant. I'm accepting you as a son. You are forgiven, my son. And then he said, bring a ring and put it on his finger. Do you understand the significance of the ring in this context? What did the ring symbolize? Do you remember Joseph? When Joseph was elevated to second in command over all Egypt, when he told of the dream, when he told Pharaoh of his dream, that there, there was going to be seven years of, of plenty and then seven years of famine, and then Pharaoh elevated Joseph to second in command, that he would be the one responsible for dishing out the food. And Pharaoh took the ring off of his own finger and put it on the finger of Joseph. What was he saying? He's saying, you are in a position of power and honor and respect. What was the daddy doing when he takes the ring and puts it on the finger? He was saying, I'm not receiving you as a servant. I'm receiving you as a son. You're coming back to me as a son, not as a slave. And then he says to bring shoes and put them on his feet. You understand that in those days the shoes would be probably just a strap of leather, maybe of wood even, but just a strap of leather that, is, that are tied to the sole of one's foot. And these boys, probably the idea is that the shoes are gone. And the daddy says, you bring shoes and put them on his feet. The significance of shoes are that when you would go in to a home as a guest or as a servant, you would take your shoes off. There would be the, the top servant, the, the number one servant would be at the door with a basin of water to wash the feet of the guests that would enter as they took their shoes off. The only person that was allowed to wear shoes in the house was the master of the house. You see the significance of the shoes now? You're not a servant. You're my son. 
you are elevated to a position of honor and of power and of respect. Understand, when a sinner comes home, he is elevated, immediately elevated to a position of respect, a position of power, a position of sonship. And then the daddy says, go kill the fatted calf. Why? Because we're going to celebrate. Why are we going to celebrate? Why are we going to celebrate? I suggest to you that the father recognizes something that we so often fail to recognize. And that is the desperate condition of a sinner. The desperate condition of one who is lost. Do you remember at the end of the story when the older brother came in and, and refused to go into the house and said, Daddy, I, I've, I've been your servant all these years. I have never failed to obey you, not even one time, and you've never even given me a goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But understand the message that the father gave to his son. All that I have is yours. But he says, the, the English Standard Version says that it was fitting. The word fitting is a little Greek word that means an unconditional necessity. He said it was, it, it was an unconditional necessity that we celebrate. Why? Because this brother of yours was lost and is found, was dead and is alive. Have you ever really stopped to think about the value of a dead person? What value do they have? And, and, and I understand that a good reputation lives on. I understand that. But really, what personal value is a dead person? What value is a person who is lost? In the parable just before this one, there was talks about the lost coin. And the coin was lost at the hands of someone else. That coin, the reason the woman swept the house completely and totally until she found the coin is because it was worthless until she had it so she could use it. A lost person is worthless to God. That's what that means. That's the reason the father said it is absolutely necessary that we celebrate because he understood that this, this boy was lost, was dead, and he was absolutely worthless until he came home. He understood the value of a, re, of a penitent sinner. It's a powerful thing that we have to recognize. Why did they celebrate? They celebrated because they recognized the importance of coming home. So often we have people in our communities, in our societies, in our families. And there's probably not a family here that's not touched in some way or another with a, a lost relative, friend, child, someone who has intentionally rebelled against the way they were raised, the way they were taught. 
I wonder, I wonder if we really, really feel the pain that the father felt. And understand that the father in this parable represents God. Do we really feel the pain that God feels? When one of his children has gone astray. Why this celebration? Because he understood. Let's answer the question. When? When did the father celebrate? Here's the first point he saw his son he ran to him he ran to him he didn't wait he ran to him he embraced him and he kissed him he didn't wait for a day or two and say you know next on Saturday we're going to kill the, the fattened calf and celebrate my son's return. No, it was immediate. An immediate celebration. Immediately, he celebrated. How did he celebrate? He celebrated with music and dancing. He celebrated by killing the fattened calf. But he celebrated immediately. And I want to look at a second point that I think is kind of hidden underneath this. He celebrated continuously. When a sinner returns, I think it's our responsibility to encourage and to continue to encourage, to continue to embrace, to continue to show them their value, to show them how important they are. Let me give you, I want to tell you just a quick little story. There is a, a, a person that, that, that I know that has responded and rebelled and responded and rebelled and responded and rebelled numerous times over the past 13 years that I've been at Covington. And every time, Every time he is embraced, he is loved, he is shown his value, he is encouraged, and he keeps up until he does it again. Now, I have to say that maybe there's some underlying reasons for it, but the point is that it keeps on happening. It keeps on coming. You keep on encouraging. You keep on, you don't ever stop. You know what the weakest moment in your life is? It's when you are no longer being encouraged by your church family. When they leave you to yourself, that's when it gets hurting. That's when it gets tough. When they leave you on your own, let me tell you what. I understand that I, I go into the office every day and I understand that I'm, I, I have the privilege of reading and studying my Bible every day. My, that's, that's my life. That's what I do. And I'm privileged to be able to earn a salary doing that. Most of you don't have that privilege. Most of you are going to go to your job and most of you are going to work with some low-life people. Am I right about it? Most of you are going to be around people that's going to, to throw stones at you and make fun of you and mock you and criticize you. And my friends, if you, we, if the rest of us don't continue to encourage one another... They're going to fall. They're going to give in to the criticism, especially if they're a new Christian. 
or if in some way they have some other kind of, of weakness that causes them to do that. And so we have to recognize that if they, we must celebrate immediately and continually. Then I want to point out the third point. How do we celebrate? How do we celebrate? Well, it's clear that they celebrated by killing the fattened calf. I want to suggest something to you. I want to suggest that first we celebrate with giving them gifts like you would when a baby is born. I want to suggest that, that there are certain gifts that are appropriate for a, a new Christian. First of all, maybe you can give them a Bible. Depending upon their age and maturity, you give them a study Bible or maybe a, simply a reference Bible. You give them a Bible. I also suggest that maybe if it's someone that's, that's been in the faith for a while and maybe they have some, a study Bible and other things, maybe you want to give them a Bible dictionary. Maybe you want to give them a good concordance or maybe you want to give them some Bible software to use on their computer. Or maybe you want to give them a, a, a commentary to help them in their study. Now you see, these gifts are appropriate for someone to help them grow and mature in the faith. And so I would recommend that here's the first step in celebration. And, and let me ask you, if someone responds during the week, how do we, do we wait till the the following assembly time to let that be known? Do you wait till you come together on Sunday or Wednesday to, to announce it to the congregation? Or do you have a call system? Maybe you have a, uh, we have a, a phone tree system at Covington and, and as, soon, as soon as something like that happens, uh, well, the elders are called beforehand and then as soon as the person is baptized or the person is restored, it goes out on the phone tree and every member gets the message. And you know what happens? That person will be flooded with phone calls of congratulations. Not waiting till Sunday right then. Sometimes... There will be people will run to that person's house to be there with them to celebrate. Maybe there would be, I don't know that this has ever happened at Covington, but maybe there would be food brought in. But this is a celebration, you see, because we understand that a lost person is alive again. And so it's a celebration. So how do we celebrate? Well, I suggest that we celebrate by letting it be known to everyone. I suggest that we celebrate with a, a meal. Here's something that I have suggested. I don't know if you all give baptismal certificates to each person when they're baptized, at Covington, we give a baptismal certificate. I've recommended this. It hasn't happened yet, but I've recommended it. I've recommended that we frame those baptismal certificates and put those around the fellowship room. And if you have to go three, four, five deep, put those around the fellowship room or maybe around some area so that we understand that this is a celebration. 
so many churches will celebrate in a month when on the month that you were born, if you were born in June, the last Sunday in June, we're going we're gonna to celebrate your birthday. Why not do that for a spiritual birth? Isn't that more important than a physical birth? Isn't it more important to see someone born again than to see someone born physically? You see, this, this, the father recognized and recognizes even to this day the importance of a sinner who comes home. So how? They killed the fat calf. They had a celebration. They, they had music and dancing. And, and understand that the older son heard the music and dancing. Now dancing is, unless it's clogging, it's about the only kind of dancing I know that anybody could hear, but he heard it. And so the idea would be that this was just a joyous Celebration, a celebration filled with joy because the sinner has come to life, because a sinner has been forgiven, because a sinner has been restored to a position of honor and respect, because a sinner has been restored to sonship. So what does, what does the celebration of a sinner coming home mean to you? What does it mean to you? How important is it to you? I want to say to you tonight, my friend, If you understand that you're in the hog pen of life, you're in the lowest point you feel that you could ever be. I want to tell you there's some folks right here tonight that are waiting to embrace you and celebrate your homecoming. I want to tell you, there's nothing like being a child of God. There is no greater life upon this earth than being a servant of God, being a son of God. If you are here tonight and you have come to yourself or come to your senses as the New American Standard Version has it. And you're ready to give that life up and come home. Why don't you come right now while we get those standard while we sing?
Michael, on behalf of the congregation, we want to thank you for a wonderful lesson, especially the lesson of encouragement. We owe it to each other. It's something we need each day, and hopefully if there's those here tonight that need that encouragement, it's true that this family's willing and able to encourage you. He told us who his mother is, but he didn't tell you who his father was, and that was Brother Dennis Rogers. And Dennis was a teacher and a preacher of the gospel, and so the faith in the Rogers family goes many years. Probably the most challenging time that Brother Dennis ever had was trying to teach Kendall Stevenson and I in high school, and that probably wore a man out, but uh, we tested his faith, but uh, he was a man of faith, and we appreciate the family and the, and the generations that have been planted from that faithful start, so thank you so much. You pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we've had tonight together to be able to come to you and worship you in song and come to you in prayer. And we thank you for the good lesson we've heard and the encouragement that uh, we've received. We know that uh, each of us will take that. And we thank you for the good lesson and that uh, we'll be strengthened as we walk through the remainder of this week and as we prepare to come back together to worship again on Sunday. We know that we'll be strengthened because of that. I ask you to be with us. Uh, for the remainder of the time this week, and that you would strengthen us, forgive us for our shortcomings, and help us to be stronger and turn to your word for guidance and uh, to direct our steps each day. We thank you for Jesus and for this avenue of prayer that we have in his name. Amen. Are there any other announcements at this time? If not, then we'll close with number 71. Number 71. <clears throat> Sing both verses. <clears throat> 